Hi everyone. I want you to take a look at this picture. What is the first thing that comes into your mind? I'll be coming back to it later. There's one thing that I'm sure I love. Unlike many other people, I enjoy being at a place where I can't see the bottom. I enjoy being alone and only hearing the bubbles go up to the surface. And sometimes, I even find it reassuring to know that I am such a small part of this world. Of course, I'm talking about the ocean. I'm very grateful to have experienced the ocean myself through scuba diving and underwater photography, which is something that I have just started. I've garnered a curiosity for the sea creatures that we have here in Indonesia. Today, I want to share that curiosity with you. I realize that I'm so fascinated with these creatures because of the way that they protect themselves. I'll also be sharing some photos. So thank you, Ka Andre, for providing them, and also Matt Tessoni. Let's get back to this picture. I still remember the very first time I had seen this. The dive guide, he pointed it out. And in my mind, I was like, it's a piece of seaweed. Why are you pointing this thing out? But then he whipped out his tiny little whiteboard. And that's a sign that whatever this was, it was rare. I was observing it very intently, and then he turned over the whiteboard. I read what it said. Robust ghost pipefish. This thing is a fish. And at that time, I couldn't believe it. Ever since that day, I would double check the pieces of seaweed I would see, trying to find out whether it's really a seaweed or if it's a fish. The robust ghost pipefish resembles a seaweed so strongly that it has very little predators. In fact, in the second photo, you can see how its head is pointed downwards. And instead of swimming against the current like other fish would, it simply sways along with it. The robust ghost pipefish has mimicry to protect itself. Here's another photo. It's quite obvious that it is a fish because, well, there's the eye, the yellow one with a black dot, and its fins. The next sea creature I want to share with you today is called the pygmy seahorse. Try to find it in this picture. As suggested by its name, it's extremely tiny. And even at its largest size, it's still smaller than a paperclip. But don't get it wrong, even though the pygmy seahorse is very, very small and difficult to find, it has a lot of predators fish, rays, and crabs. Therefore, its camouflage is extremely important. A baby pygmy seahorse is actually brown, but after it gets dispersed by the current and it latches onto a sea fan, it will adopt the same color as that sea fan. So like this pink pygmy seahorse, its parents might have been yellow, red, or even purple. And if you couldn't find it, it's right here. Another thing you would immediately notice on the seahorse is the notches it has all over its body. And those are known as tubercules. Those notches matches the sea fan. I decided to include this photo because, well, look at the sheer size of a human eye comparing to that pygmy seahorse. Whenever I go scuba diving, I get amazed with all these different color combinations we find on sea creatures. How they might not work according to color theory, but we find them everywhere in nature. I see all the fish buzzing around me filled with life. The crabs scavenging for food and maybe lobster or shrimp hiding between rocks. I feel like such a small part in this universe. But why is it that humans have such a big impact on our ocean? These sea creatures, they, they have developed the defense mechanisms to protect themselves against predators over time. But those defense mechanisms are not enough against us humans. Let's start with pollution. 
our trash often ends up in the ocean. Our fishing equipment also gets left behind. And don't forget that oil spills occur. 600 million metric tons of plastic would have accumulated in our ocean by 2040. We're closer to 2040 than we are to 1990. And 600 million metric tons is such a large number to comprehend. So let me put that into perspective for you. A 500 milliliter plastic bottle weighs about 10 grams. If we're gonna make up 1 million metric tons of these bottles, it would take 100 million of them. You could barely fit 20 in your backpack. Our marine organisms get stuck in our trash. They eat it and they eventually die. We should also be considering our greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide. But first, we truly have to understand the relationship between corals and algae. The relationship between these two organisms are known as mutualistic because they need each other to survive. They rely on one another. The algae, to start off with, lives inside the coral. It seeks protection from the coral. The coral also provides the algae with the ingredients, or let's say compounds that they need, in order to photosynthesize. And if you don't know already, photosynthesis is the process of converting carbon dioxide and water into food and oxygen. This food is why the corals rely on the algae. To put it simply, without the corals, we wouldn't have algae. And without the algae, we wouldn't have the corals. We all already know that greenhouse gases causes global warming. But did you know that when the sea temperature rises, the corals expel the algae living in them? The corals lose their color, and it's known as coral bleaching, because corals actually get their color from the algae living within them. There's also the matter of ocean acidification. Carbon dioxide dissolves in our ocean to form carbonic acid, and that triggers a chain of chemical reactions that take away the building blocks corals need. Those building blocks are carbonate ions. Think of it this way. Us humans, we need calcium to build strong bones. Well, corals, they need carbonate ions to build their strong and healthy structures. And you might be thinking, well, Kyra, what's so important about this? We don't interact with corals, we don't eat algae, we never see them often. Well, 50 to 80% of our oxygen is from the ocean. That doesn't only include the algae living within the corals, but also free living algae, marine plants, and phytoplankton. Corals are almost like the trees of our ocean. We need them to convert the carbon dioxide we produce into oxygen. And let's not forget the snappers you eat, groupers, crabs, lobsters, they all live on our coral reefs. You can already see how human activity is disrupting the relationship between algae and corals. We're going to have to maintain that mutualistic relationship if we want to survive. This is the last organism I want to show you today. It's known as the Ambon frogfish, but it's also known as the psychedelic. Because, well, look at the patterns on its body. This frogfish has a very thick and tough skin, and because of that, it's able to walk on its pectoral fins and burrow into crevices between rocks. It hides there, waiting until it can lurch at a prey moving by. But I haven't told you the most important part of this fish. It's the fact that there's only one left in Ambon. Back in 2015, there were several of them, but because of the locals tampering with it, picking it up, moving it around, shoving it into spaces between rocks so they can keep it as a secret to themselves, the population of this frogfish started dwindling. It's said that this fish might be living in deeper waters where scuba divers can't go to check. But are we really going to rely on that glimmer of hope to start protecting our ocean? 
I don't know if we have enough time to save this particular fish, but that doesn't mean we can't protect everything else we have in the ocean. We rely on it. So what can you do? Well, first, throw your trash in the trash bin. And I know I sound ridiculous saying this, but believe it or not, I've seen a fisherman throw his candy wrapper into the ocean, and he relies on the ocean to, to provide for his family. Next, we must minimize our carbon footprint in order to reduce global warming. And as I said before, global warming causes coral bleaching. How can you do this? Use reusable goods. Whether that's a metal straw, a tote bag, or a metal bottle, opt for the reusable option. I know that there's biodegradable plastic bags and plastic in general, but the truth behind those biodegradable plastics is that they only degrade in industrial facilities where the biodegradable plastic is provided with the proper enzymes, the optimum temperature. All these conditions have to be regulated by humans in order for the biodegradable plastic to actually degrade. But when scientists decided to take a biodegradable plastic bag and submerge it by the side of the dock, three years later, that same plastic bag could still hold groceries. So instead of relying on these biodegradable plastic, plastics, where we need special facilities that all, not all countries have, we should use reusable goods instead. Next, recycle and compost. This is something my family does at home. We sort out our trash and our food waste, then we send it to a recycling or composting center. You don't have to compost by yourself at home. You just need to sort it out. And yet another option is to bike and walk. If it's safe enough in your country already, if COVID-19 has subsided, then you can carpool and use public transportation. Besides reducing our carbon footprint, you need to source your fish from local markets. Local fishermen tend to fish at much a smaller scale. And because of that, it's less harmful to our environment. And I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. I still eat salmon, I still eat imported fish. But the idea is eating more local fish than imported fish. The idea is making small changes that collectively make a big impact. You need to appreciate the ocean. You need to appreciate it to find the intention of actually ch saving it and changing your actions. So the next time you're at a beach or you're eating seafood, take the time to reflect and think about what the ocean has provided you with. And more importantly, what you won't have if you don't start changing your actions now. To all the Indonesians out there, these photos of the sea creatures, they were all taken in Indonesia. So before you go about and try to find a beach internationally, remember that you can travel domestically. We literally live in the Coral Triangle if you want to snorkel and experience that. After all, we are sea creatures. We rely on the ocean just as much as they do. Like I mentioned before, we rely on the ocean to convert our carbon dioxide into oxygen, to provide us with the food that we need, to provide us with jobs. And for my 17th birthday today, from the audience watching this now and watching this in the future, I want you to change one small thing in your daily routine. Whether that's buying a metal straw and constantly using that and bringing it everywhere, or buying a tote bag, or even starting to recycle yourself. These small changes will collectively make a big impact. Thank you.